please actually, I've, I'm going to try to pronounce your name properly, but tell me how to do it right. I've, I've actually never uh, heard it said out loud. So it's, is it uh, Bechet uh, Chikmeshe? Perfect. Thank you wow. for uh, working on it, Zach. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, uh, I Googled it and tried to uh, <laughs> figure out the transliteration. So, okay, great. I did that uh, somewhat correctly. Uh, so um, Bechet joins us from the University of Washington uh, Aero Astro Department. Um, he has his PhD from Purdue, worked at, uh, in the Guidance Navigation and Control Group at JPL for many years, where he uh, did some fantastic uh, sort of seminal work on uh, the rocket soft landing problem and famously came up with this beautiful uh, convex relaxation of that problem that uh, still recovers the exact solution. And I, I know personally, I'm very excited to hear him talk today. I've been following his work for many years. So uh, with that, uh, Vajit, thanks for joining us and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Zach. I really appreciate the really kind invitation and also introduction. Uh, today, I'll uh, try to you know, capture my experiences in real-time optimal control in aerospace engineering, particularly in space because of my background that Zach mentioned. Let's see if I, all right. Uh, it's, there are several applications that I have been involved in time, and these are really uh, important applications for space engineering. One is planetary landing, particularly landing on Mars uh, that I have been involved in. I'll give a brief overview of these applications where real-time optimal control had played a role. Uh, and then, uh, again, Zach uh, mentioned about this. Uh, we extended the applicability to planetary pinpoint landing, and G fold, which is the guidance for fuel optimal large diverts. It was a technology that came out of this, again, based on real time optimal control. SpaceX took it then with several notches further, uh, <laughs> and uh, they uh, used uh, real time optimal control, particularly they use convex optimization. Uh, again, convexity is at the heart of what I will talk about in their rocket landings uh, over the last, uh, I guess, five years now. Um, and then there are other applications people have been conceiving about space, you know, missing asteroids, comets, uh, and other uh, really, really outstanding missions that I, uh, there are many of them that people have been thinking about. Hopefully this talk will touch on some of them. Uh, and recently, again, uh, this was the several uh, landings on Mars that I was involved. Uh, one is uh, in 2012, and the other is in 2021. Uh, Curiosity and Perseverance landings. Over there, I use utilized optimization. Uh, it's not to the extent that I'll talk about it uh, because these uh, were technology demonstration missions, so that we had to be conservative. But uh, despite that, I was fortunate enough to find a problem where I could use optimization. And that made a difference. For example, here, I designed the controller for the flyaway phase of the mission, which is the last phase of the landing, if you like. And optimi using optimization allowed us to crash, actually, the sky crane, which landed the rover uh, on the ground, and then it had to crash far, far away with a certain fuel allocation. In both missions, uh, this flight that it performed on Mars were way beyond what they originally thought it could do. Uh, in the first one, it was 650 meters. In the second one, more than, I think, 700 meters. Uh, and this is a picture of the crash, actually. This was uh, far away from the landing site of the rover, so it uh, provided a certain amount of safety. Anyways, uh, today, uh, you know, there are different components of uh, decision-making, autonomous, let's say, decision-making for uh, spacecraft or aircraft missions, for that matter. Uh, this is a way of capturing it, and I'll specifically talk uh, about trajectory planning. Uh, there is mission planning, tactical planning. I don't want to go into too many of details, but trajectory planning is the part that I'll talk about. And then the feedback control. Uh, again, this I will not talk much about. Here I um, uh, will give a general view of what these things are. Uh, if you ever took a control course, uh, you know, there is the feedback loop that you may know about. Uh, there is standard uh, components, feedback control, state estimation. Uh, and then uh, uh, there is the uh, trajectory planning. Uh, trajectory planning generates the reference uh, trajectories that the feedback control system has to execute, if you like. 
And if you design this uh, trajectory as well, then you get better optimality, better performance out of your system. Uh, the feedback control part ensures robustness. That's again a general command, uh, but it's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, and the trajectory planner does this planning based upon typically a model that it has of the system. All right. And here, as I mentioned, convexity is at the heart of real-time trajectory planning or real-time optimal control. I use these words interchangeably, but when I say optimal control I, or trajectory planning, I mean the same thing, more or less. Uh, here, if we formulate these problems, typically they turn out to be non-convex, meaning that you, or your cost function may have multiple minima, or more importantly, your, the set you are optimizing over may be non-convex, meaning that if you there are points that you connect with the line, the line may go out of the set, the definition of uh, you know, non-convexity. The key point is convexification, which means uh, you generate another problem, which is, uh, this didn't turn out to be the best way of presenting, sorry for that, but that, that may work. Um, it, in this case, you have a convex function, meaning that you are optimizing, uh, which uh, may have a single optima or uh, well-characterized convex set of optima. And you are uh, optimizing over a convex set. Uh, what's the advantage, disadvantage? In the first case, uh, it's hard to ensure convergence of a numerical scheme that you devise to find the optima. Uh, and typically, even in cases where it works, it may not work as reliably or it may work slowly. Uh, in general, of course, these are general comments. But when you convexify the problem, uh, the convex problems have nice properties. Uh, you have uh, fast algorithms that guarantee solutions for these problems, of course, to some numerical accuracy. And they are very, very reliable methods. That's the advantage. So if we can use tools of convex optimization, it's a good thing. That's the heart of the story here. Um, and the convexification is the process of converting these problems on the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And typically, uh, in uh, control problems that we deal with, uh, there are dynamics. You know, the vehicle has some dynamics. Uh, there are state and control constraints. And there are costs and rewards that uh, you have to optimize. They capture the mission objectives. And state and control constraints are you know, you're, you don't have a, maybe a control force or torque bigger than a certain amount, like saturation, typical constraint. State constraints typically come from safety or other considerations of that kind. And what do we do for convexification? Again, this is a bit of a, maybe my research, but it also, you know, captures what others do to what other researchers. First, uh, there are techniques we have been developing on uh, convexification of non-convex control constraints. For this type of constraints, we came up with a fairly generic setup for which uh, we can losslessly convexify uh, control constraints. I'll show some examples uh, about that. And I, in shorthand, I call it LCVX, lossless convexification. And then uh, there are if it's not always possible to convexify every constraint, obviously, and uh, typically state constraints or coupled state control constraints are of this kind. And in this case, we utilize a method we call successive convexification. You can call it sequential convex programming. You know, people use similar methods uh, of this form. Uh, you know, it generates a sequence of uh, convex problems that in the limit hopefully approximates the actual non-convex one. And by solving them, you converge to a solution. Uh, our guarantees in the second, uh, when we have to use the second method, uh, what we call here successive convexification, SCVX, is typically less uh, strong. Uh, and the solution algorithms are not as efficient typically, but you know, that's what you, we can do. Uh, here is a motivating example. Maybe that's the example that got me going at least, you know, about 17, 18 years, now 17 years ago, I guess. Um, this is the mass uh, landing problem. Uh, this was a problem given to me in 2004 while I was at JPL. Uh, 
And uh, the situation up to now actually is the following. We enter the Martian atmosphere, we slow down uh, due to drag, we manipulate the drag forces by doing some maneuvers at the beginning during entry. Then we, turn, we open our parachute. Uh, this slows us down even further uh, at supersonic speeds. But at some point, you have to cut this chute off and turn on your thrusters because Martian atmosphere is not thick enough to sustain a soft landing otherwise. And this uh, lands you. Uh, the current landing system is you come down, you slow down, there's a, a winch that lowers the rover and then the, uh, the descent vehicle flies away. Uh, till now, we have not performed what is called pinpoint landing, meaning that given a target, we didn't ensure landings within maybe a couple of hundred meters or a kilometer uh, of that uh, target. We, our accuracy started in tens of kilometers, dropped down to about 10 kilometers, I think, in MSL. Now it's down to four kilometers or so radius, I believe. So it's still, we are not still in the pinpoint landing domain uh, to perform pinpoint landing, which is typically defined as less than a kilometer. You need several technologies. One is terrain relative navigation sensor to determine your horizontal position, not only vertical, but horizontal. And actually it's flown on uh, Mars 2020 mission, which is flown in 20, which landed in 2021 recently, Perseverance mission. This uh, sensor has been flown. The second technology is the optimal guidance to take you from the, you know, after you cut off to shoot off, you may find yourself within, you know, four to five kilometers of the, the landing uh, location, ideal landing location. You may want to fly back. The altitude is typically two to three kilometers. Uh, so that's a, quite an oblique trajectory to fly back, let's say. And that's uh, what has to be computed in real time. Uh, so that uh, this algorithm, this trajectory can be executed. Anyways, this problem uh, can be simply formulated as a, you know, a point mass with a thruster attached to it. Uh, consider this as the point mass. Uh, there is a thrust vector attached to it, and it turns out that this thrust vector has an upper bound uh, on magnitude and a lower bound on magnitude. This lower bound on the magnitude may makes the thrust region in which this thrust vector has to live in a non-convex region. There is another constraint which can be important. Uh, it is thrust pointing constraint. This is imposed due to having maybe a camera because to tilt the thrust that way, you have to turn the vehicle. If you turn it too much, you, your downward looking radar or camera may not may lose contact with the ground. So you don't want that and they don't want to turn this vehicle over too much. So that adds to non-convexity. So this blue area is, in, of course, it's 3D, but I'm drawing it in 2D. Is the region where your thrust vector lives in. It's non-convex because you can take these two points combined with a line. It's not in the domain. Uh, <clears throat> due to that, the problem was difficult uh, to solve. You have to use you know, a non-convex solution method, if you like like a CDX. Uh, then uh, I came up with a uh, relaxation of this problem originally, uh, which was basically introducing a slack variable. This slack variable, uh, which gamma, uh, extended the, state, the space of control from three dimensions to four dimensions, uh, but I'm depicting in two to three here. And it generated a cone uh, cut by a plane, uh, this cone cut by a plane generated a convex region. Everything in that convex volume was feasible now. Actually, when you do that, you introduce some, if you like, solutions that are not realizable. You add solutions that are not in your feasible domain. But what happens is, due to a property of the optimal solutions that they are, they satisfy some generalization of non-singularity of the optimal solution or optimal arcs, you can ensure that all the solutions are projectable back to the original set feasibly, uh, because in the lifted space, the solutions occur in the or in some part of the boundary, not in all parts of the boundary, but in some part of the boundary, uh, which can be projected back feasibly to the original space. Uh, this is what we call losses convexification of the control constraints. 
Then uh, instead of solving the original non-convex uh, problem, you solve the new relaxed or lifted, if you like, uh, uh, convex problem to obtain the global optimal solutions of the original one. Uh, that's uh, what we did originally, and uh, this led to you know solution. Uh, you know, people using these algorithms. Uh, first, they used it actually surprisingly not uh, in real things. Uh, they used it in Monte Carlos. It's very interesting actually because they were not able to run Monte Carlos with other uh, non-convex optimization-based algorithms and. Uh, that was slowing them down in their analysis and so when I gave them this algorithm they could run Monte Carlos now they could run them fast and they don't have to tweak stuff you know Monte Carlo didn't crash or something like that so they liked it eventually I said you know there are mathematical proofs nobody cared of course and um, but uh, since they saw it working on you know in their Monte Carlos they said okay this seemed to work uh, and they gave, it eventually built enough confidence that we got some funding and we put these algorithms on board the rocket in 2012. Uh, we did some flights uh, with offline generated trajectories first because they didn't believe that this rocket could do these things first. But once they believed that, they gave us some more funding to fly these things on board the rocket uh, in 2013. Then in 2014, uh, both the terrain relative navigation sensor and the real time of, of you know trajectory generator work together on board so uh, there are some flight videos i'll show you one uh, that was taken in 2013 i believe again this was before spacex so spacex really uh, overshadowed us but you know this is all we got <laughs> but it's great that they overshadowed us uh, you know Can you hear the video? As the mass the engineering team performs the final system checks on Zombie, JPL's new fuel optimal large divert guidance algorithm, known as GFold, is about to get its largest demonstration to date. With support from NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, this groundbreaking project enables JPL to validate robust landing technology. This Google Earth visualization is created from the actual trajectory data recorded by Zombie in flight. The trajectory may look simple, but this flight represented an unprecedented achievement in autonomous rocket technology. The half mile translation across the desert was in fact a spontaneous landing diversion in which the rocket was commanded to abort its initial nearby landing spot during final approach, aggressively change direction, and begin following a new trajectory that was first calculated only one second earlier. The G-Fold computer calculated this new trajectory mid-air in real time choosing a new landing site in the distance and optimizing the path through the sky to burn the least amount of fuel possible. Although the engineering teams knew the intended landing diversion before launch, the vehicle systems received the updated instructions mid-flight with no advance warning. Once commanded to change direction, the system instantly throttled up the engine and aimed the vehicle hard over to meet the new objective. This flight was yet another expansion of Zombie's vehicle flight dynamics reaching a maximum altitude of 1,200 feet while flying out of plane with the landing pads, then traversing downrange nearly a half mile over the desert floor at more than 50 miles an hour before gently touching down within nine inches of its target. Anyways, uh, what you're seeing is uh, we are the real flight. Uh, there is a single uh, engine which can be gimbaled a few degrees in two axes long to axis and uh, it's the the standard description of this problem is control problem is uh, the broomstick uh, on your finger uh, it uh, this engine is controlling both attitude or orientation of the vehicle as well as the translational motion of the vehicle so it's it's a fairly complicated control problem and uh, uh, this company, uh, Maston Aerospace, well, I think uh, they are growing now. But at the time, they were a small company uh, that built this rocket, thanks to them. Uh, and thanks to NASA, we were able to fly this uh, test uh, flight campaign in three consecutive years. The video is not the greatest video, but at least it shows that it flew. But when you are there, it's really exciting because at the end of the, this type of maneuvers, there is a part where 
the vehicle has to really slam down the you know, brakes and calm down. That's the maybe most exciting part of the landing. Anyways, let me switch. Uh, so as I mentioned, SpaceX uh, flew, again, convex optimization due to its reliability and its applicability to the air missions. And it made a difference, oh, it's optimal control technology, real-time optimal control technology, based on convex optimization made a major difference. And they were kind enough to acknowledge our contributions to this area. And uh, my collaborator, long-time collaborator, actually who helped uh, significantly, was maybe the second person who contributed to GFOLT, uh, the most uh, JPL, Lash Blackmore later on, join uh, SpaceX and he did fantastic work there. He's now their lead engineer, controls engineer, I think in uh, their Falcon landings. Uh, he wrote this beautiful article I recommend everybody to read um, in the National Academy uh, of Engineering, Bridge, uh, I think, magazine. He summarizes the development of uh, well, control technologies for uh, rockets and landing. Anyways, uh, this is not the only example. For example, uh, we have another problem, which is a similar control uh, constraint. Uh, here, there is a quad rotor, uh, any multi rotor actually, and uh, there is a thrust vector it can generate, which is uh, has an upper bound. Uh, if you look at it as a uh, point mass again, and it has a lower bound on thrust too, actually, in, uh, for some propellers. The reason is when you have zero, thrust, then you lose control authority for orientation. You can't apply torque. So we want to uh, maintain a level of uh, lower bound on uh, thrust. So be, by doing differential thrusting or, you know, uh, among propellers, that way you get, uh, you get uh, attitude maneuvering as well, attitude control as well. So, and also there may be pointing constraints again due to, you know, not uh, flipping the vehicle over because you may be carrying a camera or a payload that's sensitive to that. Uh, and we have been using this kind of techniques in our lab. Actually, I'll show you at the end of the movie where you, you'll see this in action. Uh, and again, uh, we had the other problem for uh, satellite tacking to a spinning uh, space station. Uh, we use this problem with other, other sources of non-convexity, but one was again about uh, this uh, minimum thrust and so on, that we use some of these techniques. I'll just quickly pass because this has a lot of details that I don't want to get into, but there's a paper, both published and on archive, I believe. Another example of uh, lossless convexification, maybe in space, is uh, if you have different gimbling available at different thrust levels, maybe at high thrust level, you may not have a gimbaled engine, uh, maybe your gimbal is less, uh, but at low thrust, you may have larger gimbal angles. Then the combined region of thrust, like uh, depicted here, may be non-convex. Uh, typically, you can handle these things with integer or binary variables, uh, describing two modes, but you don't have to do that. There are, we extended these uh, techniques, mathematical techniques to handle this kind of non-convexities as well. And uh, now I'll switch gears a little bit, uh, and I'll talk about uh, non-convexities that we deal with, and they are hard to handle uh, with losses convexification because they are state constraints, and we don't have such relaxations in this case. And I'll say, show you some examples uh, first, and then uh, maybe a solution technique to handle them. Uh, we call them state trigger constraints. These are some uh, constraint types that we are dealing with these days quite a bit. Uh, and I, I really enjoy uh, seeing them. Uh, they are complicated, but they capture some constraints, complicated constraints nicely. The idea is, I tried to depict it in picture, but basically uh, there is a trigger, let's say Z is your state or solution variable, whatever that may be. You impose a constraint like this one on the right, when another condition is satisfied. So it's a conditional constraint. I rather de describe this in uh, maybe with some examples. And uh, for example, <clears throat> ah, by the way, there is something I want to say. This type of constraints typically, because it's what it says is, if you are in a set, impose another constraint that maybe that describes another set. So it's like taking intersections uh, of two sets in a way of speaking. Uh, 
And you can capture these constraints by using binary variables, but in optimal control, you have to impose these constraints for every time step, which even in discrete time, there may be many. And uh, you may have multiple of these constraints. Adding binary variables is not typically a good idea in that case. You know, binary variables increase the complexity of the solution exponentially. But if you, we have been developing other techniques uh, to handle them uh, with this, uh, uh, again, with different ways. I show mathematically some of them here. They look like complementarity type constraints. Again, mathematics of this uh, are in papers. Uh, in that case, you can handle them with continuous solution variables, which lend themselves better to the techniques that we use, which are based on convex optimization. So we prefer those formulations. Uh, here is one uh, example. Uh, this is called state triggered line of sight constraint. Uh, it's a in landing you see these constraints actually. Uh, as you come down to a landing site, you may want to impose these constraints. It's when you are at a certain distance, you know, when you are observing the landing location, you want to impose that you are, your cameras are looking at the landing location so it can, they can observe the landing location. Uh, this is, uh, so the line of sight constraint on the camera is triggered by your distance uh, to the location. Another interesting was state triggered approach angle constraint. This one is even more intuitive. Uh, you want to be in an approach cone, or sometimes they call it glide slope. Uh, you don't want to come down too close to the ground. You want to be in this uh, greenish uh, cone when you are at a certain distance, when you are below a certain distance to the target. So when you are in a, if you think of it, it's when you are in a sphere around the target, you want to be in this cone, if you like, all right? This region, in both cases, the trigger is convex, actually, it's interesting. And the constraint is uh, convex too, but uh, this region is the constraint. You have to be here, but if you take the union of this with the outside region where you, know, where you can be, the union is non-convex, so the resulting region is non-convex, uh, the constraint is non-convex. Another one, uh, in this case, uh, a rocket example, uh, let's say you have a you know, rocket going up, uh, you may have a velocity triggered angle of attack constraint. When you are at high velocities, you don't want your angle of attack too much. Uh, again, field of view state trigger constraint, I think it's similar to the landing example that I just described before. Uh, but this one is quite interesting, the velocity triggered uh, angle of attack constraints. Again, you can find papers where we you, Describe this in more detail. In these cases, uh, we don't uh, have, as I said, uh, purely convex solution methods, uh, and we have to use a form of sequential convex programming. And again, it's not only we do this. For example, uh, different groups who are in, uh, working on real-time optimal control use similar methods. Zach's research group, for example, in Stanford, as well as Marco Polone's research group in Stanford and others around the country use this type of methods. So uh, here, uh, what you do is you have an optimal uh, control problem again with the cost, dynamics, state and control constraints. Uh, and uh, some of them may be convex, non-convex, but uh, uh, due to having non-convex state or coupled state and control constraints, you have to resort to this sequential methods uh, of convexification, if you like. And the method that we use typically has several components. Uh, typically, you have an initial trajectory, yes. It doesn't have to be very accurate, but of course, if it's accurate, it's better. This guess, if it's a better guess, it's better. Then uh, what you do is uh, uh, you use this initial trajectory to linearize or convexify in general the non-convexities. There are several things you do, for example, to handle artificial infeasibility that you may induce to the problem. Uh, you put uh, what we call virtual controls or buffers. Uh, and uh, also you impose uh, what we call trust regions to, you know, uh, to eliminate the possibility of having unbounded solutions. Uh, trust regions are regions in which you, you know, your approximations are good if you like. And then you discretize as well, so that you have finite dimensional problem. And then you have a 
convex finite dimensional problem, which uh, sub problem we call it, convex sub problem. You solve this with a convex solver. Uh, you generate the next trajectory. You use this one to the convexify and do all these things again. And this uh, loop, iterative loop, continues. Uh, you are what you are doing here is you are generating a sequence of convex sub problems. And the final convex sub problem you have, hopefully, is close enough to the actual non-convex problem, approximates it well enough uh, so that you can use this solution as the solution to the approximate solution to the non-convex problem. Here is an example. Uh, this is one that actually we put on a GitHub, I believe. You can find the code for this. Uh, this is the flip maneuver of the SpaceX vehicle. Of course, we didn't know the vehicle's parameters or anything like that. We made it up uh, by guessing. <laughs> so SpaceX didn't give us any information. Uh, I have to put this disclaimer. But it, yes, it captures the essentials of the problem. It's the 2D version of the problem where we have two translational degrees of freedom and one rotational one to simplify. It's a good problem. It has enough number of non-convexities. Uh, and uh, here is a brief description. And we solved it in some, uh, you know, my student gives some properties of the solver that we use. We use ECOS here, uh, apparently. I think because he wanted to make it publicly available. Uh, and I, mean, I would encourage you to access this solver. Um, and here is the GitHub address. Uh, I, I can distribute these things. And I, also, you can go to uh, our website. I think there's a link there. Here is a typical maneuver that's generated. Uh, used two different uh, methods of sequential convex programming. He's comparing them here. Uh, one is called penalized stress region. The other is the successive convex application. I talked about this one, but this one actually, though the uh, CVX seems to have better theoretical guarantees that we obtained, uh, the one that we don't have better theoretical guarantees work better, uh, as you, that's, I guess, uh, always the case. <laughs> It's also surprising. We are trying to analyze this method a bit more now nowadays. Here are some convergence. Uh, you know how quickly it converged. This is a typical situation. These methods typically converge quite fast after a couple of trajectory optimization uh, iterations. We get really close to the you know, desired solutions. Now I will switch uh, gear a little bit and I'll talk about uh, the numerical methods. Uh, the, another piece of the puzzle is having the right numerical uh, methods uh, to solve these problems. Um, let me check the time and see if, sorry, I don't have my clock with me, so I have to do this silly trick. Because whether you have a losslessly convexified problem or you are using a form of uh, sequential convex programming, you have to solve convex problems never at the end of the day. And here we are going to discuss some methods that actually I think are promising and a lot of people, again, uh, our colleagues, uh, Zach included, are working on, I think. Uh, these are uh, first order methods to, to solve convex optimization problems. Typically the problems that we end up having solving are what are uh, known as second uh, order comprogramming problems, SOCPs. Um, here is a method that I'll describe, a first order method that doesn't use Hessian information, but only uses uh, the gradient information to solve these problems. In the past, I have been using uh, IPMs, interior point method algorithms. Uh, I didn't develop any uh, specific one. I, implemented the existing methods. Uh, I, I have been using a primal dual uh, IPM uh, over many years uh, based on what's known as Merotra series heuristics. But uh, recently I find the use of first order methods uh, very appealing for several reasons that I'll describe hopefully well. Uh, one is they are simple. Anything simple is good. Um, not only technically, but also to promote these methods. Uh, here uh, is a published version of what we are working on. There is another version that has more uh, capability that's coming hopefully soon. But 
Here is you have a quadratic cost, uh, some linear equality constraints, and some uh, convex inequality constraints captured by this inclusion relations, where Z is a close convex set. And this is what we call projected, uh, proportional integral projected gradient algorithm. Actually, it's an interesting algorithm. The equations may not look very intuitive. It's just what it does is it generates a gradient. And then uh, based on the gradient, it takes a step. It projects the new iterate to the set Z, uh, which is a closed convex set. That's what it does at the heart. All it requires is uh, some matrix vector multiplications and additions and so on. So it's very simple. But there is one operation, the projection operation. That's, uh, you know, ultimately the projection operation is finding the closest point to a set. Uh, sorry, finding the closest point in a set to a point. That's what we do. Uh, and this one has a nice interpretation in continuous time, meaning that uh, when you do solve problems iteratively, uh, complex optimization problems iteratively, you generate a dynamical system because it's an iterative process. You can really view this dynamical system in continuous time and it gives some intuition about what's going on. Uh, here, uh, this projected uh, PIPG, projected uh, or proportional integral projected gradient method can be viewed as follows. There is this, this is the gradient process. It's your plant. It's simple uh, integrator, right? scaled integrator. There is a projection operator in the feedback loop, and there is a PI controller here, if you like. Uh, a PI controller. This is the uh, P, this is the integral part, if you like. There is another piece too, but nevertheless, it's a PI controller with some uh, multipliers, both pre and post multipliers. This is your only nonlinear element here. So if you view this system, uh, you know, if you ever studied robust control, this is like a linear system, uh, you know, with a nonlinear component in the feedback loop. And this is not a dynamical component. This is a static mapping, but it's a projection. It's a nonlinear mapping. And you can analyze the stability of this system, actually, that by using monotonicity properties of this uh, operator. That's how you prove the convergence of this type of methods, typically. And the good thing about this method is that you can adapt it to optimal control very well because, you know, this is a generic method, but like here, this is the generic version of the formulation. But when you do optimal control in discrete time, especially convex, uh, if the problem is convex, that's what we are dealing with because our sub problems are convex. All the projections that you have to do, these uh, projections on this set Z, are decomposable into smaller pieces. Uh, for each time step, you may have control constraints, state constraints that are separable, uh, and they are it just, uh, they are uh, they are variables which has smaller sizes because you know they belong to each time step, like a control variable may be a three-dimensional vector or something like that. And the sets you are projecting over may be simple sets. Uh, those are advantages that you may have for this type of projective gradient methods. Again, this is the interpretation. Then you have a bit more involved looking uh, algorithm, but it's actually quite simple. This paper is recently published, uh, and the uh, updated version where uh, this uh, equality constraints are removed and the, there are conic in inclusion constraints. Uh, we, we replace them with conic inclusion constraints that include equalities. Uh, it's coming soon. Uh, Anyways, these are some simple sets on which you can do the projection analytically in closed form expressions. All right, so you don't have to do any uh, any, any any iterations or something like that. So they are simple projections. That's what, and then you can also do intersections of them. That's our new paper, uh, quite efficiently actually. Anyways, uh, these are some initial results uh, where we compare the performance of these uh, methods. Again, we didn't op optimize the implementation of these methods uh, yet, but nevertheless, they do well. And when you compare with, for example, Groby, which is uh, one of the fastest solvers around, you know, they seem to solve relevant problems like quadrilateral rotor pl motion planning around obstacles or grasp optimization for robotics or power descent guidance for planetary landing pretty well, uh, even with a non-optimized implementation. 
Uh, also, we realize warm starting helps a lot in these methods, which is not the case for IPMs, actually. For IPMs, uh, sometimes warm starting doesn't help, actually, it hurts. Anyways, we are uh, developing these technologies. Uh, there are others around the world. Uh, Real-time optimal control is getting a lot of attention thanks to revitalization of the space and, in general, aerospace industry. Uh, uh, this is a project that we are involved in with NASA, which is uh, developing next generation of landing technologies, and a part of it is, uh, is, is, is uh, real-time optimal control. This project is called SPLICE. You can again find it on NASA's website. And we have uh, the hardware testbed. We uh, test our real-time optimal control uh, methods uh, quite constantly, not uh, over the last year, thing, you know, because of COVID, but hopefully we will pick up speed again soon. Here I'll show you some flights that we have recorded in, uh, you know, let me show you one video and finish my presentation. This, in this video, what you will see is a flight around 10 obstacles uh, with a quad rotor. 10 uh, static obstacles, of course, we assume that we know where those obstacles are, so we don't solve the vision problem here, we just solve the trajectory optimization and control problem. Let me see if I can uh, show. Okay, here it is. Here, what you are seeing is, uh, I, uh, I stopped it briefly, but, we are in this video. You are viewing the, our panel, our, our laptop, or we have a handheld device actually that you can view these things. And these are obstacles. This is we are flying many the quad rotor manually, and as it flies, the trajectories are being updated. Here we are not flying the trajectories. We are just showing that as we fly the vehicle, the trajectories are optimal trajectories are being recomputed just to show that they are computed as we fly. And then you'll see some of these flights. Again, they are computing on board in real time. As we go further, actually, one of the things that I'm really happy about is that beyond trajectory optimization, our feedback controllers are very stable, uh, and there are good reasons for it. But that's a subject of another discussion, and that makes uh, the aggressive uh, trajectories feasible. Without a good feedback controller, these are typically very risky. Let me show. Uh, hmm, I don't have that video, but I thought I had it. But anyways, maybe next time. We, in my, we have a uh, YouTube channel. You will see other uh, videos where we are flying through uh, mobile obstacles, other quad rotors. Uh, that that's also fun to watch. This is my group. Uh, there have been a lot of people who contributed uh, to this work over years. Uh, I'm getting older. They are getting. They are still at the same age because students seems to move away and then new students come and join our group and they all contribute. So I'm really thankful to their work. Uh, also, I have had a lot of collaborators, some are listed here, some are not. Uh, and they really contributed to intellectually to our, you know, to this work. Uh, so it's a community effort. These are our sponsors. I really thank you for, for again, for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much. I mean, if I can help with any questions, I'll be more than happy to do so. I hope I didn't lose everybody. Zach, are you muted? Oh. Oh, I have to unmute um, Was again. I continuous? Did I ever get dropped? No, you were, you were good the entire time. All right, all right. great. <laughs> I was scared for a while. Anyways. 
All right. Sorry for the technical glitches, but yeah, Petra, thank you so much for the, the fantastic talk. Uh, and uh, the technical things seem to work uh, pretty well. So I think I'll get there. Um, so uh, the way we'll run this now, we have maybe 15 minutes for Q&A. So if anyone wants to ask questions, feel free to hit the raise hand button uh, and speak up. Otherwise, if there's some technical issues there, just type it into the chat and I can read them out. So we have a first question uh, already from Farbod. Good. Okay. Ah, thank, thanks, Abhishek, for a nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's very interesting to see that how the trajectory of realization of such a uh, agile maneuvers in these platforms. So I was wondering I mean, uh, about the last video that you showed us. You were trying to avoid these obstacles, right? Uh, so are you using this algorithm that you, you presented in the end? What was PIPG? Oh, not in this one. This one uses our original IPM. Still, it uses uh, this, you know, the original IPM that we coded and flew on uh, on the rocket that you saw. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, again a primal dual uh, IPM for you know SOCPs, second order com programs. It's not the most efficient. I think PIPG can be made more efficient. I believe that's again something we are working on. Uh, but uh, hopefully we will get even faster results with PIPG. I was wondering the feasible set here is non-convex. Is that right? Yeah, because of the because of the obstacles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, how do you? I mean, how, do you use a convexification for just oh. constraints or? There are two non-convexities here. One is the thrust vector has also non-convexity in this case because of the fact that our propellers has to always be on uh, for attitude control. Uh, that has to be a lower uh, mount on thrust. That we losslessly convexify. That was okay. The problem was obstacles. Those are non-convex state constraints. For this, uh, we use uh, again sequential, uh, you know, sequential convex programming technique called the successive convexification. Each sub problem was losslessly convexified for control constraints. But you know, we generated a sequence of trajectories. What we do is. You know, uh, we start with actually line gases. Based upon that, we generate uh, separating hyperplanes. Uh, you know, again, with that you can only ensure local optimality. You know, uh, because you may be on the not the optimal side of the obstacle. You know, if you don't want to do something exhaustive, that's what we have been doing. Uh, that's what we did Got it. for that part. Okay. Uh, we have a question in the chat as well, uh, more sort of high level question about uh, in, in aerospace applications uh, and needing to solve these problems very quickly online uh, and asking kind of about the sort of processors and compute that's available on these uh, spacecrafts. Are they, uh, I guess, yeah, general question about the types of computers you're, you're running these algorithms on. This is actually, uh, you know, again, uh, an interesting question because one of the things that really uh, causes a lot of headache uh, proposing new technologies of this kind for space is the limitation of the uh, processors on board spacecraft. Typically, they are 15 to 20 years behind, 10 years, 20 years. It's, it depends on the situation. Like, uh, the, uh, like the, you know, the landing algorithms we tested on PAR PC750. I forgot how fast they were, but they are really, really slow. You know, uh, they are space hardened. Uh, uh, space hardening takes a lot of time, energy, money. So they, that happens not often. Uh, uh, for that reason, we are always very limited. For that reason, GNNC or guidance control, navigation control engineers are very sensitive to putting uh, this, you know, computationally what they call heavy algorithms. Okay. Actually, they are not heavy, but to their standards, they are heavy. So uh, uh, that's a limitation. I mean, that's a limitation and uh, culture you have to deal with. Okay, and that's why, for example, this PIPG I forgot to mention. This kind of first order methods are great because they look so simple. You know, like when you show them the algorithm, oh, this is a simple algorithm. It makes sense, and it looks like something control engineers know. You know, when you show the feedback. Uh, Grab they say, oh, okay, that's something I understand. There is nonlinear component. You know, I know that if you satisfy certain things, this will be stable, i.e., the algorithm will be convergent. 
And it will be fast potentially because, you know, they are simple algebra expressions, they see. That's really good in general because, you know, you have to still prove that it's fast, of course, but, you know, we have to work on all these things ultimately to make sure that these algorithms uh, may go eventually to some mission. I'm sure these are also considerations for, you know, aeronautical applications like, uh, you know, a a airplanes and whatnot, you know, people will not put a very fancy maybe computer on board, so, but they want to still uh, run these algorithms. So these, uh, these limitations, especially in space, are always uh, important limitations and it actually may, it, it drives the research too, I think. Okay, we have uh, one more in the chat so far on the, the PIPG method and asking what the about the convergence rate and how does it compare to oh, second order methods? That's a very good question. Uh, they are typically uh, quadratic convergence, I believe you obtain. Let me try to remember the last paper. But there was one other, they, they are typically much faster than, uh, or at least as fast as other first order methods. That's what we proved mathematically and observed uh, also with numerical experiments that we compare. But there was another interesting uh, property of PIPG that the recent one that we are working on, that it also ensures convergence in the constraints faster. You know, like the constraints seem to converge faster, certain constraints, which is also important. Like you get a feasible solution quite fast. That's also a nice property of PIPG. For example, for IPMs, you are a bit in the dark, you know, Till convergence, you don't know what the heck happened, uh, but when it, it go, does converge fast, typically it takes less number of iterations uh, because they are second order methods. Uh, but per iteration, the cost of computation is of course high, much higher. So that's the type of comparison, maybe with a second order method like an IPM. Uh, uh, how do you say it? Uh, more iterations, but per iteration you have better uh, convergence. We have good convergence properties that we proved uh, mathematically and demonstrated uh, on experiments, numerical experiments. I hope I made sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. Brian, I think you were next. Yeah, I've got a, uh, just a, a follow-up question on that. Have you, have you done any, co uh, any comparison on the PIPG algorithm with uh, these kind of um, like aug augmented Lagrangian methods? Uh, particularly, we've, we've done a little bit of uh, looking into augmented Lagrangian, uh, applying it to conic problems where you do a very similar projection operator on the dual variables, but your primal variables are still being optimized using like a full second order uh, method. Oh, I see, I see. And so I'm, I'm curious if you've like, have you done any comparison with, 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 uh, Not, with that kind of algorithm? Think... To me, they seem, at least on the surface, like they'd have some similarities. I don't think we did to the particular form, type of algorithms. I think this, uh, my student made comparisons to ADMM, uh, there is another method I forgot. Uh, the, I had the acronym. Uh, I forgot the acronym for it. It's another method. I, I can forward the paper. I think he, he's going to put the, it soon on ICRA archive, so you can see the exact method he compared to, and uh, basically compared to uh, first order methods. I don't think he compared. I think yours is somewhere in between the second order and first order kind of you know uh, method. Uh, I'll mention to him actually. They say maybe he will have. Uh, you know, is it difficult to implement? Because typically that's the bottom line. If it's not, he may, or if you have code, he may use it. And anyways, uh, uh, I mean, most of our code is written in Julia, which I saw you guys were also using. So we could probably uh, share some code. I think they are coding in Julia too, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can. I have never coded in Julia, so I, I'm not really good at. I know how to use MATLAB, Python, and C. I'm getting old. So, but they are, I think they are using Julia, uh, so they, it's probably easy to modify or play with their code. Uh, I'll also ask them to, when they are ready to put it on uh, on, on uh, GitHub or something. But our, if you want to check the successive convexification implementation, I believe they are quite a bit of the code is on uh, on GitHub. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely be checking it out. And also, we wrote recently a, a paper that we submitted, uh, but there is an archive version of the paper that my student Danilo Malupta put on, on archive. Uh, there are a bunch of examples there for successive convexification I forgot to mention. Uh, Co-authors are from Stanford, you know, your colleagues Marco Pavon and his group. 
Uh, and there are a lot of uh, examples with code that I believe right now accessible. Um, sorry, I'm going a bit uh, more than your question asked. Sorry. I know. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Fargo, do you have another one? I actually uh, partially get the answer that was actually asking about that there is a similarity between uh, this uh, KPG algorithm that you explained and this proximal algorithm in general. Uh, so I was wondering if, if you looked into this, uh, to, into the details, what, what, what is the relationship or what better behavior you get from them? Honestly, I have to look at the algorithm. Uh, you, you know, I haven't looked at uh, the one that you mentioned very closely. So I, uh, I have just known the existence. That's all. <laughs> you know, uh, the thing that attracted me to PIPG is very simple. Uh, it has feedback interpretation. It only uses gradient information. And these are very, very useful because I can go literally to a controls guy, as I mentioned, of course, with some advanced knowledge of control, not uh, just PID or something, and explain that, look, this is why it converges and the operations are pretty straightforward. That's what made it attractive to me. Um, but it still has some uh, proving to do, I guess, because, you know, uh, I have used IPMs all over the place, and I use other people's IPM implementations, and I was, you know, I was always satisfied with IPMs. With first order methods, you know, uh, uh, will they run into some issues that I haven't foreseen? I mean, there is a lot of work going on, you know, you guys are working on it. Uh, there are probably other groups who are doing this kind of work. So hopefully there will be enough, you know, enough momentum of this type of methods, and hopefully, you know, they will show, uh, they will prove their promise, let's, let's say. I, I agree with you. I mean, we recently started looking to such an algorithms also for legacy like system, and it seems that they are very robust. Yeah, I, I, it's, they should be because they are so, you know, they use so little information, right? Like, exactly. think about the gradient. I mean, gradient, I may be even making my computations wrong. It doesn't matter that much, you know, like there's certain robustness embedded to it, you know, which is what I like about gradient methods. The only worry I have is that the number of iterations in some problems may become arbitrary, too large. That you know, that's the again. But you have proof. Of course, you have guarantees for convergence, right? We have proofs. But the problem is, <laughs> with all these proofs, there is a joke that I heard also from Stephen Boyd. All IPMs work, you know, converge in twenty steps or something. You know, uh, this is a, a bit of a joke. But you know, I I was independently making that joke before. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I haven't seen any problem which took more than I saw, of course. But you know. We rarely problems that took more than 20, 25 steps of an IPM solve. In this case, I don't know. You know, the uh, uh, complexity analysis says one thing, but if you hit the limit of complexity analysis, it's never good. You know, typically you want to really be uh, not pushed to the theoretical limit. You see what I mean? Uh, for practical purposes, and that's what IPMs prove themselves with. You know, like. If you ever compute the theoretical bound, you never even come close. You see what I mean? Uh, right. In these cases, will we ever come close? And will it be the regular occur occurrence, or will it be like IPMs? You know, one, uh, there will be theoretical bounds, but you will never come close. You know, I don't know. Uh, am I making sense, or am I? No, no, no. Absolutely, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we're technically out of time now. I, hopefully I can be a little bit selfish and, and ask one small sure, technical sure. question. I'm wondering on these um, the state dependent constraint stuff, you have these complementarity conditions. Are you actually solving like a mathematical program with complementarity constraints directly or do you have some other method for no. handling these things? We basically approximate uh, or not approximate, we use uh, some functions uh, to represent them, you know, functional equality constraints, you know, we use mean function or something like that. But then recently we start using soft means, you know, and then yeah, we, yeah, okay. we use homotopy parameters. It's getting really dirty after, you know, yeah, yeah. You, start, you start with something, it seems to work in some problems, then you run into other problems in other cases, then we switch to homotopy, then homotopy has nice properties, but you know, these are ultimately nasty constraints, you know. We should talk about this some more. Uh, I have a lot of experience and pain trying to solve these MPCC problems uh, with all kinds of methods, like you say. And uh, we've, I think we've hit on something that actually works now that's really good. That, 
is based on uh, it's based on exploiting sort of similarities to uh, interior point methods. Actually, these are like I think they have a lot of uh, how do you say it uh, insights they can provide this uh, tackling these problems. One uh, paper again we put online is about the homotopy stuff that we did for trust overbound. Uh, this is an applied paper, but when you deal with bunch of trusters with impulse bit. Uh, you have this kind of constraints. Uh, and my student, Danilo Maliuta, uh, went a long way in terms of dealing with those things. The problem is typically, you know, mathematical guarantees become a bit softer, of course, you know, uh, unfortunately. But uh, what I'm looking for is uh, also methods which has practical value too, as well as theoretical. I am always open to new ideas, new methods in this domain, because I think it's a realm of uh, situations that we will face. Uh, actually, recently I realized also homotopy and uh, you know the S procedure, right? Like when you have triggering going on, it's almost like uh, this conditional stuff going on. It's almost like this S procedure that we do in convex optimization, a constraint being active when some other thing is active. If both are convex, you combine them with S procedure. You know, this is a standard trick, uh, you know, if you ever did linear matrix inequalities or things like that. And in that, uh, you introduce a new solution variable, uh, you know. It acts almost like a homotopy parameter. It's, there are all these interesting connections. So I'm sure you guys update some other interesting things too. I'm looking forward to. Uh, yeah, we should talk more about this. More. Um, OK, so in the interest of time, I think we are out of time. So I, I guess we'll have to stop here. But uh, we'd love to chat more uh, about all these things. Um, so thanks again so much for, for the talk. Really interesting, really enjoyed it. And uh, tomorrow we have the actual live uh, workshop session as part of the conference. So hopefully we'll see everybody tomorrow. Um, I'm actually sort of, I need to check my calendar on the times to verify one more time. So tomorrow it's, uh, we start at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, and go to about 5 p.m. And we'll have uh, several in-depth tutorial sessions for different solver tools. We'll have a virtual poster session. We'll have a great uh, panel discussion for, with all of our keynote speakers. So please join us tomorrow for the, uh, for the live session. Thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, thanks again to Pajit for the great talk. Thank you very much for your invitation. Again, Zach, did you send any you know, invites for those sessions already? Or We've been trying to advertise them, yeah. Um, I can forward you the, the emails uh, if you have uh, some more emails uh, lists that you can send them out to that'd be great i'll appreciate that uh, you know i'm on travel i'm a bit absent-minded if you send i'll really really appreciate it thank you yeah yeah we'll send it no problem thanks thank thanks for coming yeah. i'm listening yeah. bye-bye